and his name is Jesus. He sits high and he looks low. Amen. And he has an ear to hear our humble cry. Praise God. And I'm thankful for that, church. I said, I'm thankful for that. I am thankful that we have a God that hears us. Amen. Hallelujah. A God that answers. Amen. He answers prayer. Hallelujah. Somebody said that prayer changes things. Amen. It does. Amen. The scripture says that the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. Amen. In other words, much happens when the righteous pray. Hallelujah. Praise God. According to his divine will. Much happens when we pray. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we're praying this morning, amen, that God will have his way, amen, in our lives today, amen, that we have an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say into the church, amen, praise God. We're praying that lives will be changed, amen, that we will be matured, amen, that we will grow in the Lord, that we would stay on the battlefield for the Lord, amen, hallelujah, amen, praise God. We're certainly thankful today, we honor Amen. The presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. We honor, amen, in the absence of our presiding bishop, Bishop Davis. To Sister Davis, God bless you. And to our First Lady Evangelist Dallas this morning. To all the ministers of the gospel, to the deacons and the missionaries. Saints and friends, amen. We thank God for each and every one of you. We honor Mother Atwater in her absence this morning. Praise God. We're thankful today, amen, just to be in the presence, amen, of the Savior. Amen. Is that all right? Amen. Praise God. Just to be in the presence of the Savior. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty today. Amen. Praise God. So I am thankful today, amen, just to be able to stand before you this morning to break the bread of life, amen, which is the word of God today. I'm going to ask that you would turn with me to the book of Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And we're going to be reading, praise God, in the 17th chapter of Acts. Hallelujah. Beginning with verse number 21. Hallelujah. Beginning with verse number 21. Verse 21 through and including verse 30. Hallelujah. 21 through and including verse 30 today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. The 17th chapter of Acts, verses 21 through and including verse 30. When you have that, you can acknowledge it by saying amen. amen. I'm going to ask that you would please stand in reverence to the word of God this morning. Amen. Amen. And beginning with verse number 21, it says, For all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things... You are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom, therefore, you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything 
seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For, mu for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stones, graven by art of man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Praise be to God. We thank the Lord for the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. Praise God. We want to focus right there on verse number 20, 29. For, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone graven by the art of man's device. Amen. We want to use for the topic this morning created in the image of God. <laughs> created in the image of God. I mean, this morning, we've, we've touched on this several times, including we've recently kind of, in Bible study, kind of mentioned this. I re re hesitantly mentioned it because I knew that I would be um, preaching on this, but nevertheless, it was relevant unto what we were talking about. But nevertheless, we've been touching on this particular passage of Scripture here in the book of Acts on several occasions and quoted several parts of this um, because it's a very important passage of Scripture in that it, it explains our image that we've been created in. And, more importantly, it explains the creator that had created us. Paul here, in the book of Acts here, Paul, who's now an apostle of Jesus Christ, now begins to argue the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. He argues the fact that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Because he's experienced and have been an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Yeah. He's an eyewitness of the divine one who raised from the dead, who was dead by the crucifixion that was com completed by the Jews. But was raised by the power of the Holy Ghost. Right. And now Paul, who was Saul and who was an opponent of God, who was an enemy of God, is now a proclaimer of the gospel, the very gospel that he persecuted the church for. And now that Paul is now a proclaimer of the gospel, he now has adversaries himself. But nevertheless, Paul did not let that stop him from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And like most preachers that really want to get their message across, we, we, we use whatever avenues we have. Whatever venues we have, we try to make most of declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ for those that really truly want to get people saved. For those that truly want to declare the divine God that was who created all things. We, we want to make the most of any venue that we have. I mean, even myself, you know, we, we utilize it. 
Facebook. We have a fa- the church has a Facebook account. Um, we also have a YouTube account. And we're under no delusion that we don't have thousands of followers. And that's okay. But whatever venue we can and whatever avenue we can use, we use to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our, own, that's our main objective. That's our main objective. And whatever God's will be, let it be done. And nevertheless, we want to take and use all the opportunities we can to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and I'm in no exception to that with the Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was on his traveling missionary journeys. Him being an apostle who was sent by Jesus Christ, who was taught directly by Jesus Christ, now on a mission. He's on a mission to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people will be saved. Now, in here that we've seen in our text, it says, for all the Athenians and strangers, verse number 21 says in the book of Acts chapter 17, which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. In other words, you have this meeting spot here in Athens. That's why you find, in, in, even in, in, in college, a lot, of, a lot of talk on Greek mythology and, and things of the Romans and the Greeks because these were, quote, the smart people of the world. These were the intellects of the world. These were those who had knowledge. And so a lot of scholars use a lot of Greek mythology and things of the the Greeks in order to instruct and to teach those that are learned. And it's no exception even in Paul's time. So Paul wanted to utilize a spot to where he would get the most attention for the gospel of Jesus Christ. These Athenians, in other words, people of Athens, and it says, and strangers would gather here in Greece. They would gather here and they would learn or to hear some new philosophy or some new doctrine. They were very, very religious people. They, they, by the way, that's, that's, it's no stranger that, that the scientific community wants to exit God away. They want to take God out of science. You can't take God out of science. God created science. But they want to take God out of science. And they're familiar because they know that even in times past that religious people were scientists. They were scientists. It was religious people. It was biblical people that discovered science. But in order to do and to stretch out their wings as far away from God as they could, they have to X away from God. And that's why now, even currently, the scientific community are based off a lot of atheists. But that doesn't stop God. That didn't stop God. God God is the creator of all things. So these philosophers, these intellects, they gathered themselves in Athens. This is where, this was the town square, if you was, if you will. This was the universities, if you will, where they would gather to get information. And as it says, in all the Athenians and strangers, in other words, those that weren't Athenians, people from all over would come. It says, and they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's how religious folks are. That's how people that are religious are. You know, they, 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 never, they never get settled. And you get people like that in the church. They never, they never get settled on the truth of the gospel, they have to always have something new. Something has to always be more fascinating or something more brighter or something that's, that's more in, intriguing to the intellect. The simplicity of the gospel is not enough for them. That's why Paul, t- just put a pin for there just for a moment. That's why Paul called it the foolishness of preaching. He, was, he wasn't making mockery 
But he's saying the foolishness of preaching the gospel, it confounds those that are wise. In other words, it blows their mind. It's too simple for them. But it's the simplicity and the foolishness of the simplicity of the gospel that saves folk. And this is what's getting ready to happen right here in Athens. So Paul finds a spot where all these folks gather so he can get an audience. So that he can preach Jesus Christ. Amen. And he goes to Mars Hill. Now Mars Hill is, is actually named so because of the Greek deity of war, Arios. The Greek deity of war, Arios. Hence Mars, Aries. Mars and then Hill, Pagus. A rock. So it's the Eris Rock, it's where Eris Rock, the Greek god of war, where, where they would gather in the sense of gaining more knowledge. Paul said, I, I got a spot where I can go. And look, look what it says here in our text. It says, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, Eris Pagas, and said, you men of Athens... I perceive that in all things, you are too superstitious. Now, this word superstitious literally just simply means religious. That's all it simply means, religious. People, people that are superstitious, they, 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 some very rarely may call themselves atheists, but, but they're, they're religious. You know, I kind of say it lightly how my mother used to be. My mother, you know, God rest her soul, she... she, she she got a knowledge of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, but she was superstitious before, well before she passed away. She, she got knowledge of Jesus Christ and to learn that those things, that there's no weapon formed against her that will prosper. She understood that. She learned that before she passed away. She, she learned that the God of the universe is in all control. But before that, she was very superstitious, and she got it on us. It was just a superstitious time they lived in. You know, cat, black cat, cross your toe. You better step back 10 spaces or you're going to have bad luck. Or, or if somebody sweep your foot with a broom, you better spit on it or you'll go to jail. Or if you break a, or break a mirror, you'll have bad luck and so on and so forth. And she believed a lot of those things. And, but, but, but Christ came into her life and made a change. But all that is is religious. It, it, that's all it is, is religion. You know, again, she's, she, she's in good company. You know, a lot of folks believe that stuff. But Christ came and made a difference. And, th and this is what Paul sees here. When he goes to Athens, he says, I perceive that you are too superstitious, too religious. L listen, here's why. He said, for, verse 23 says, for as I pass by, and beheld your devotions. You know, when we have praise and worship, that's devotion part of the service. That's when we devote, supposedly, so that we can prep our hearts and our minds for this part of the service. That's what praise and worship is. It's supposed to be able to usher us into the presence of God so that the ground would be broken so that when the word of God comes across, you'll be ripe to receive it. That's what praise and worship is supposed to be. It's devotion. It's devotion. It's when you devote the time. Now, hopefully, you're supposed to come here already devoting your time before you come to church. So that you're ripe, so that when you get in, you're already ready. You're already ready. That when you come corporately together, it's nothing but a praise festival. That's hopefully how you're supposed to be. Not coming in talking about this and talking about that and all this. And then as soon as you get to praise and worship time, everybody's supposed to click in God. No, it ain't supposed to work that way. Amen. God ain't like a water fountain. You're supposed to turn him on and off like that. Amen. You know, you're supposed to be devoted. Yeah. Like, like they were. They were. But they were voted too devoted. Not to God of heaven, but to all these other gods, little g's. And Paul said, I, 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 I perceive I perceive your devotions. He says, I found an altar. Verse 23 says, 
For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. They, they were that religious that they worship all these other gods, these Greek methodical gods. They worshiped that they even, so I heard about the God of Israel. We don't know him. He's kind of unknown to us. So we'll put an even altar up for him just in case, just to make it case, the case for if any, if, just in case he's right. We got him in a, we got him in a, in a, in a bullpen as well. They didn't want to miss one. That's how some religious people are. They tap into Islam and they tap into to Hinduism and they, they tap into this and they tap into that just, just in case. But, but you, you need to settle down for a moment and listen to the truth. We have, listen, we have been created in the image of the Almighty. That, that's that's that we have been that's the argument that Paul is getting ready to give to these intellects. And, and if you look at it carefully, for those that are intellects, for those that like to question God, look, look at Paul for just a moment here. I want you to understand Paul by him by 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 nature, or at least by his training, was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. They were the religious lawyers. They were experts of the law of God. They, they studied the law. Matter of fact, they were prepped from youth up until adulthood to be Pharisees. They studied the law. They were, they, they were the biblical scholars of their day. And Paul the Apostle was one of them. He, he not only was a scholar, but he was taught by one of the most prominent theologians of his day, Gamaliel. But all that was, was no good for God. When God, this was all before Paul got saved, he had all this biblical knowledge. All this biblical knowledge of the law and the prophets. And he understood it, and he was a Pharisee. But then when Jesus came, it illuminated everything that he learned in the correct way. It, it totally turned his world upside down. And now we have an intellectual person who's saved now. And God can use whoever he will. For the most part, God just uses ordinary people. For, that's for the most part. For the, for the most part, God used a, just ordinary people, and, it, and it's rightfully so, because when God used prominent people, whether it be intellect or money or power, those people like to try to take the credit from God. So God likes to choose just ordinary. If you look through all the scriptures, most of the people were just ordinary people, fishermen. The ordinary people, not, not, to, not to degrade the fishing trade, that's an important trade, but they were just ordinary people. They weren't scholars. God rarely uses scholars. But in this case, he used the scholar, Paul the Apostle. And he turned his world upside down, and now he's on a mission for God, for Jesus Christ. And that same scholar is now going to preach to scholars. He's now going to preach to scholars here in our text today. And so for those that are, quote, scholars, and maybe this in the audience, I want you to listen to what Paul's argument here is. Paul, listen to Paul. He says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. I'm getting ready to show you who this unknown God you ignorantly worship is. And look how he starts. Anyone who's been around my preaching or teaching long enough, you know that I like to go back to foundations, to the fundamentals. I don't stay there, but <coughs> fundamentals are foundation on purpose. It's what everything else is built on. If you don't have a good foundation, it crumbles. That's why we have to understand the foundation. The foundation, we have the foundations up in the book of Genesis where everything, if, if, Genesis, if Genesis is not true, then we can't believe anything else of the Bible. Yeah. Particularly, you know, a lot of, lot of atheists and a lot of um, agnostics and people that doubt the Bible, supposedly smart people, 
they usually try to dis dissect and tear apart the first 13 chapters of Genesis. They try to say, that can't be true. That can't be true. And so they'll tell you why it's not true. And if it's not true, the, if, if Genesis is not true, then the rest of the Bible has no, 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 nothing to hold on to. Because the rest of the Bible, including Jesus himself, goes back and quotes Genesis. So even Paul the Apostle here is now getting ready to quote Genesis. The God, listen, he, he, he's talking to them, these, these intellectuals. And the first thing he says in verse 24, he says, God, listen, that made the world and all things therein. Now, let me stop there for just a moment. Because we talked for a topic this morning, created in the image of God. We have been created. We, we did not evolve. And I don't apologize for saying that. And you can call me a, a science denier if you want to. Because that's not even science. It don't even make sense. Right. It doesn't make sense. Amen. And I will say it before anybody. I will stand on Mars Hill and say it to the intellects, just as Paul is saying, it do, don't make sense Amen. to be evolved. Evolved from what? Where did it come from? And to be able to in evolve something as complex as we are as human beings is nonsense. Amen. There's absolutely nothing that came from nothing. Amen. God who is supreme created all things. Amen. We have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I've made the argument, it's a simple argument. There's, everything you see, something made it. Everything you see. You, I wouldn't be as foolish to say, oh, if I seen this bottle of water in the desert, oh, this bottle of water must have evolved and came into a bottle. You would think something is wrong with me to say, well, you may find some water in the desert somewhere, but certainly you won't find it in a, in a bottle with a cap on it, with a label that says purified water on it. And we are far, far, if you use your brain just a little bit, we are far, far more complex than the water that's in this bottle and the label that's wrapped around it Amen. and the plastic that it's made by. Amen. We're far more complex. The scripture says, Whose report do you believe? I believe in the report of the Lord. Amen. So Paul says, God, verse 24, that made the world and all things therein. Where did he get that from? From Genesis. The record that Mo God, get God gave to Moses wasn't anybody there when God did it. God who always exists. God is self-existent. That's why he's called Elohim, God. He's called Jehovah, Elohim, Jehovah, the self-existing one. He's always existed. Amen. There was never a time that God was created. If something or somehow God was created, it would be God. Right. Right. But it's the one who always existed, created all things, including you and I. Amen. Amen. Listen, he says, the God that made the world... And all things therein. This is the first part of his argument. Seeing that he, listen, is the Lord of heaven and earth. He's establishing that. He's establishing that there's none like him. So, so get that out the picture. There's nothing like God. There's never going to be another God. So he's automatically, in verse 21, he's denouncing all these deities that they're worshiping, all these devotions. He automatically says, I'm focusing here on this one here. You got to the unknown God. Let me declare him unto you. Amen. And he's, de he's denouncing them right there in verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. Heaven is the spear of everything, the universe, if you will, and, and beyond. That's heaven. He's using a, a simple word, heaven, meaning the universe and all that dwell therein, and then as a reference point, earth. 
We're just a little speck in God's universe, earth that is, that God references. That's why you, in order to let him know that we are included, he says earth as well. He says, listen, the, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made of hands. Right? He's, he's debouncing the temple worship in the sense that God is bigger than that. Not, not to say that, that God didn't ordain the temple worship, but he's letting them know that, yes, temple worship was, was ordained by God, but God is bigger than dwelling in a temple. How, how, how many know that? I like to think you know that. God is here, but he's bigger than New Tabernacle. God is here, right here at 1548 Wentworth Road, but he's road, but he's bigger than New Tabernacle. He's bigger than that. And that's all Paul's saying here. He, said, he says, he, listen, he says, God that made the heaven, the world, and all things that are in, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So he's expanding God beyond their puny little minds. And he says, listen, neither, verse 25, is worship with man's hands. All these engravings, all these statues you got here, no, you can't contain God to that. You can't contain him to that. You can't, you can't put God in a box of just what you create, what your hands can come up with. By, uh, by the way, if you go back and look at some of the deities, that they, the statues, if you go to Rome and, and over in Greece and see all these statues and things of the bizarre statues that are supposed to be gods, and it's all things that man come up with, God is bigger than that. He's grander than that. He's far bigger than what men, you know, you've seen some with fish heads and, and all sorts of snake kind of gods and cows and all sorts of things that man has created to be God. He's bigger than all of that, seeing that he has created all those things. Paul is arguing here. And it says he has made, he's neither worshiped with man's hands, verse 25, as though he needed anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things in other words God don't need us because he's given us everything we need so why would he need us when he's the supplier of all of our needs oh you know one thing God only wants from us is our worship he, he wants our worship we don't have enough else to give to God that's the only thing that we, can't, we can give to God that he don't have is our worship, your time, your energy, my time, my energy. That's the only thing we can give to God. To, what do you give to somebody who has the cattle of a thousand hills? They belong to him. Worship. That's all you can do. It's like the old saying, what do you give to somebody that has everything? You give them some time. You give them adoration. You spend time with the Almighty. Listen, he says, neither is worship with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And then Paul goes on to say, and have made of one blood all nations. I love this. Now, I don't want you to miss this. Because, again, we've been created in his image. Therefore, we need not to be racist. We need to stop it, church. Amen. If anybody needs to stop it, it should be the church. Amen. If anybody should be unified, it should be the body of Christ. Amen. And this is what Paul is talking about here. Listen, don't miss this. He says, verse 26, and have made, listen, of one blood. One blood. All nations. He's made of one blood, all nations of men, for to dwell on the all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And what, what, what he's simply saying is, see, he's speaking to the intellectual minds that if you're saying God is these statues, wait a minute, how can God be these statues if we're offspring of him and he's made of us offspring, one blood, we're in his image, how can he be a statue? If he's made us after his image, 
Only God determines our habitations. He allowed us to be separated. That's why you have different nations and different languages. Nations and tongues. The scripture don't use the word race. We're all one race. That's that one blood Paul's talking about here. One blood. We're one blood. One race. But many nationalities and tongues, languages. And I explained that before. Scripture explains why that happened. It's because of sin that that happened. So God had to scatter men and women all over the earth and those that understood each other through the Babylon Tower exposition. He gave them abilities to understand each other. And when they scattered to their own regions, when they multiplied, they began to look like each other. And that's why you have nations. That explains that, church. See, the word of God has everything you need. Everything you need. Now, you still going to have some stubborn folks that still want to buck against God. Yeah, but I'm better than you. Well, you can do that all you want to. The Lord come back, but you're going to answer to God before he come back. Because he's saying here, he has made, listen, he's, he's presenting them Christ. Now, through Christ, we have been unified. Whatever your national nationality is, whatever your language, your tongue is, we have been unified through the one blood of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. And the point is, is that if he has done this for us as humans, how can be any of these statues be God? Yes. How can any of these statues that you're worshiping be God? Listen, he says, listen, God that made all these things he have made verse 26 of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth that's all humans to be all over the face of the earth and he have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation in other words your boundaries this is Europe this is Asia this is the Africa God has determined that. Amen. God has determined that. But we're one blood. One blood. Amen. Until we get that, you, you, you're not going to see this in heaven, church. It's going to be one blood in heaven. Amen. It's not going to be segregated in heaven. You got the wrong heaven. That, that disturbs me when it seems like we preach only to one race. That, that disturbs me. Especially when you call on the name of Jesus. Amen. There's something wrong with that picture. That's not what heaven's going to be like, and at least the, the biblical heaven. Now, your hell may be like that, but heaven is not going to be that way. We're not going to be segregated. Matter of fact, that's what Pentecost was all about. That, that Babylon Tower experience where it divided their languages on the day of Pentecost, it was one language. They heard them speak in their own language the wonderful works of God. Amen. Pentecost brought us together. The blood of Jesus Christ brought us together. The Holy Ghost brings us together. It unifies us. Because we have been created in the image of the Almighty Church. Paul goes on to say, listen, 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 verse 27, that, listen, he says, we should seek the Lord. So just in case, just happily that they might feel after him and find him. In other words, I'm going to present this gospel to you that perhaps you hearing, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I don't have to twist your arm. God don't twist no one's arm. He just said, you spill it out. You preach it. This is all Paul's doing. He's on the Mount Mar Mars Hill where all these intellects are, and he's just spilling it out and letting the Holy Ghost do the work. Amen. It does the work. It, it does the work. It speaks to hearts. It speaks to minds, to those that aren't closed off. God will speak to your heart. He will transform your heart if you let him. He will turn your world right side up. It's already upside down. 
He would turn it right side up, and then you have some sense about yourself. God will make light of what's dark. Hallelujah. He'll make the crooked road straight. He'll make the hill world plain. It's only apart from him is where there's confusion. It's only apart from Jesus Christ where there's chaos. When you look at Jesus Christ, everything makes sense. We all knew that we were male and female. We all knew that we were created in his image. It's when we depart away from the image of God is when there's chaos. It's when we depart from the word of God where there's confusion. And we have to learn that Jesus Christ has come that we may have life and life more abundantly. Let's look a little further in this text. He says, he has made one blood, verse 26 again, all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and ha has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might fill after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He's not far from us. God hadn't left us. We left him. I said, God hasn't left us. We left him. I like to remind you over and over again, because it's important to understand this. Here's the, the example of that, the proof of that is that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God said, where art thou, Adam? It wasn't that God lost them. They lost God. Amen. God, where, God was where he was normally at. They're the one that moved. Amen. God was already at the meeting spot that he always met them in the cool of the day. Yes. They're the one that moved. So it wasn't that God was lost. But he knew they weren't in the meeting spot. And we have to learn that, that God is not going to conform to your way or my way. We have to come back to him. <laughs> See, God is not created after our image. We are created after his image. Let me say that again. God is not created after our image. I know we like to create God. We, may, we like to make the comfortable God. We, make, we like to make the God that we can deal with. The God that don't have any rules. At least the rules that, that interrupt my life. And he likes rules for other people's life, but not the rules that interrupt my life. No, God is not created after our image. We are created after his image. And Paul is making this argument here. He says that hopefully you might just seek after him. He says, because verse 28 says, for in him we live, we move, and have our being. Now, I wanted to read that to you again because, that, because we read that, and I've said this before, and some of you already know where I'm going with this. Verse 28 says, for in him, meaning Christ, we live and move. And have our being. In other words, we have no life without Christ. We don't move about without Christ. And we don't even have who we are, our being, without Christ. Amen, amen, amen. This wasn't Paul's original saying right here. Paul, Paul, Paul was quoting one of the Greek philosophers, Epimenendez. Go Google Epi, Epimenendez. Google Epibenendez, and you'll find these words in ancient Cretan writings. And Paul is so brilliant by the spirit of the Holy Ghost that he knows to quote them at this moment. Because he's wanting to let them know that these stones that you're worshiping, these statues that you're worshiping, all these devotions that you have, if they're real, then even your own philosophers has gotten it wrong. But, I, but he says, but I beg to agree with your philosopher, Epimenendez, that because in the real God, we live, we move, and have our being. And he uses that as an argument. Look, 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 look closely here. Created in the image of God is what we're talking about here. 
he uses this quote from a Cretan Greek philosopher. He uses this as his argument to prove that God is the God that created everything. Listen, he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Listen, and here it is. He's giving credit to where credit's due. When I quote somebody, see, some folks, you know, they quote folks and try to make it their own. Now, if it's not mine, I'm going to let you know it ain't come from me. This come from Dr. So-and-so or Pastor So-and-so or Bishop So-and-so. If I can remember, if I don't, I say I heard somewhere. I won't try to make you think, especially if it's something brilliant. You know, when it's my quote, I'll let you know God gave me this one. But if it's somebody else, and Paul is giving credit to where credit is due. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Listen, as certain also of your own poets have said. That poet is Epimenendez. He just didn't mention his name here. He says, some of your own poets have said this. Listen, and here's his, here's his, here's his deduction of that. If that's true, we are also his offspring. If you're an offspring of God, and if God is one of these statues, then you're a statue as well. Does that make sense? An offspring is a chip off the old block, isn't it? I mean, if, 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 if God is in a statue, then we'll be running around here nothing but statues. But we have life in us. At least I have life. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> we have life. Why do we have life? Because we serve a living God. Amen. Not a statue, not a dead God. Yes. See, this is the argument Paul is making here. They understand this. They understand this, that, 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 that he's speaking something different here. But by the way, we started on verse 21. But look, look at verse 20. Verse 20 says... For there, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. See, they were coming there because they want to hear. We heard about this Paul. He's talking about resurrection of the dead and true life and all this. That's strange. See, see, see these, these Greek gods, they can't give you life. All that you can do is make people feel good. That's all they can do is make people feel like they're useful. All they can do is make people feel like they're meaning because of what the Greek God is, or God's, plural. But they can't really do anything. And by the way, have not ever done anything because they're false. This is the argument Paul is pointing out, that, that because your philosopher has said in him, he's right about that. We live, move, and have our being. He's right about that. Because we are offspring of this living God. See, see, some people don't even think about what they're saying. You know, they're sitting there worshiping all these false gods, false deities. But yet, they realize that them gods can't do anything for them. But yet, they quote and look at someone who is bright and talks about a living God who has created us. It couldn't have been created by a statue. This could not have happened by a statue. All the splendor thereof could not have happened by a statue. Neither was this bottle of water made by a statue. It was made by God. Amen. God. Like I said about this bottle of water, you wouldn't say, if somebody said, well, uh, who, Members Mark made this. And somebody told you that Members Mark is a stone on the ground. Wait a minute. How did that stone make this? You would say you're foolish. And that's all Paul was pointing out to these foolish Athenians. That you're trying to say that the splendor of all heaven and earth and these stones made it? He said, I beg to differ. That if I live, he lives also. <laughs> Glory to God, church. I'm hoping somebody's getting this. I'm hoping somebody's getting this. You're not here on accident. You're here on purpose, and God has an intention for your life. Don't think that you're not important. God deemed you important because he created you. It's only the nonsense of those that want to trample all over you to say that you're not important. Those that want to use you say you're not important. 
But yet they need you to get what they want because they need to step on you. But God said, no, you've been fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's the point Paul is trying to make here. Listen, he says, for they seek the Lord, if happily they may fill after him and find him, for he is, though he is not far from every one of us, because in him we live, move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for you are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God head is likened to gold. Don't try to build a gold God or silver or stone or graven by the art of man's device. If you're real in what you are, you touch yourself, yeah, that hurts. What, how, how do you think a, 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 a stone can make something that's alive? He's making a good argument. I hope you, I hope you see it. He's got a good point. That, that they're worshiping. They got all these devotions, all these, all these altars and statues all over the place. You still go to Reese now, you see some of this stuff. The folks are standing in all of it. You can't tell them about Jesus, but they stand in all of this stuff. Still, still in it all. But them statues did not do one thing. Amen. Neither can a stone make this water bottle. Amen. And we got to think in that way. We have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Listen, Amen. we are after God's image. Let me show you there. I told you this in the very beginning. We're almost done. In Genesis chapter number 2. Now this is what the devil, he wants to take away this. Like I said, he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We have been made after God's own image, church. We shouldn't be in the day right now in 2022 trying to determine whether a male is a male and a female is a female. Amen. We, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be ashamed to determine that we know these things. Amen. They have been determined all the way from the beginning of creation. They already have been determined. And we say this with all love and all due respect, but God needs to help some of these people. Amen. And I say that with all love and due respect, but they can't get help if we keep silent on these things. We are created after God's image, church, after the image of God. Listen, in, in Genesis chapter number 2, let's look at this for just a moment, then I'm going to let you go. Genesis chapter number 2, beginning with verse 21, it says, And the Lord God caused, now I'm going to stop there, it says, And the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, Jehovah Elohim, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. God did this. That's why I can believe it. That's why I can believe it. That's what faith is. Now you can believe the nonsense of evolution that you've all come from apes and we just got the good gene of the matter. Well, I'm not trying to figure out why some of them still running around here though, but nevertheless, they can believe that if they want to. I'm looking at the complexity of this, this matter. Amen. How about the eye? Your, your eyes. You ever thought about how, you, how, how did your eye evolve? Just your eye. I'm talking about just your eye. I'm not talking about one cell of your body. I'm talking about just your eye. How did that evolve? Your eye is complex. Now, I'm not a scientist, neither the son of a scientist, but I know enough to know that our, my eye is complex. I do photography, and I, have, I use lenses. And man has learned to create lenses, but your lenses of your natural born eye are far more complex than my Canon lenses that I have on my camera. And I can do some wonders with them lenses on my camera. But look what God has done. Look what God has done. You're able to see color. Isn't that glorious? You're able to see out the peripherals. I can see almost a little bit back there a little bit from when I turn to a certain angle and not be looking at Brother Charles back there. I can, you, can see the, you can see the depth. I can know that you're not as close as this bottle is to me. 
That's the wonders, the splendor of God. Listen, it says, look at verse 21 of Genesis. This is how it happened. It says, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he sat. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. In other words, God did surgery on Adam. Why, why can we believe that man can do surgery, but we can't believe God did it? If he can create us in the first place, why can't, why, why can't we believe that he can take a rib out and create another person from it? A woe man. Not another man, but a woe man. Who can now be flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Look, look, look what it goes on to say. It says, and the rib which the Lord, Jehovah, Elohim, had taken from man, made he a woe man, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, listen, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave into his wife and they shall be, listen, one flesh. Can't get this with same sex. You can only get a factuation. Can't get that kind of a unity. You can't, church. And I refuse to be bullied into it. I refuse to be bullied into thinking something that's not. I refuse to come against the principle of science. I refuse to come against the principles of God Almighty. Now, some people are uncomfortable right now. I don't understand why. Because this is simple. Because you let people tell you these things are wrong. You let somebody convince you another way. But we have been created, church. Where have we come against this from? What point do we learn that we have to be fearful to talk about something that's natural? Amen. Where do we have to get to a point to where we have to shut up about things that are common sense? There was a time when people had split personalities, we sought help for them. When people used to be schizophrenic, we, we sought help for them. Now we, we're rejoicing and, and we're applauding and inviting people to have split personalities. What's your pronoun? Oh, I'm they. Call me these and they and them. Now I'm saying that with all due respect because they need help. And I'm saying this with all compassion. Just in case somebody want to misquote me, this is what compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they need help. I'm not a them. I'm a single individual. Individual made in the image of God. And we have come to a place to when you come against the principles of God, to come to the principles of nature, the principles of science, you come to anything to believe. The next thing you'll be telling me that you are now an animal, which there are some that's doing that already. They just haven't made it mainstream yet. They bullied us into taking your pronouns. What if your pronoun is a dog? Then you accept that, huh? Look, look, what, look what the Bible says about this. Look what the Bible says. Listen, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. God performed the first holy matrimony. That's God's idea. Not, not the LGBTQ community, not man's, not, not man's idea. Marriage is God's idea. And because it's his idea, it goes according to his boundaries and according to the way he set forth. Not the way we think about it and how we want to do it. And now the Bible gives us facts. It tells us what happened. Not everything that what happened, God condoned. And we know that many had many wives. Solomon, we can think about him right off the bat, had many wives, and, not, and to boot he had concubines, living women as well. 
I don't even know, so see how one man can handle one wife, let alone all the wives he had. Hundreds of wives. And it was out of order with God. God never condoned it. He never, it's just in the Bible because it actually happened. God's not trying to hold, hide anything from us. It's the truth. It happened, so he's going to pro proclaim it, what, what, happened in the, what happened in Solomon's day. But that don't, mean, that don't mean he condoned it. Let me show you why I know that. Listen, listen. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. Now, by the way, that's a man and a woman. Listen, and shall cleave unto his wife, not plural, but wife, and listen, and they shall be one flesh, them two. You know why? Because them two coming together, it's, it, it works spiritually and naturally. That's God's intention. That, that's God's design. Amen. Marriage is God's design. So, so in the spiritual realm, a man and a woman becoming holy in holy matrimony, getting married, they're now representing heaven itself. It's the closest thing on earth that represents heaven itself. You have two individuals that come together and are representing heaven itself. And on the natural sense, it represents heaven itself because we are, guess what, offspring of God, as Paul noted, as his argument in the book of Acts, he noted that we're offspring of God. We're a chip off the old block. Amen. And to prove that those two that represents heaven coming together will make offspring. Amen. Amen. They will make offspring. And listen, listen. Verse 25, don't miss this. Genesis chapter 2, we're still in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 25, it says, listen, and they were both naked, the man and his wife. And we're not ashamed. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and we're not ashamed. This was before the fall. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. That's, that's key right there to understanding what sin has done. That's key to understanding what sin has done. Now I'm going to put a pin in that one for just a moment. But that part right there, verse 25, go with me, chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5. Here's a, re, here's a repeat. It's what God done. Just in case we missed it. Here's a repeat what God has done. Genesis chapter 5, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. You know what Adam means? The word Adam means man. Adam means man. The word Adam means man. It means man. Listen, it says, this is the generation, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Listen, God's getting ready to play off of the word Adam. God is getting ready to play off the word Adam in order to show you him being a chip off of the old block, an offspring of him created in his image. Listen when he says, this is the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him male and female created he them and blessed them, listen, and called their name Adam in the day when God created them. Man. They're one because the two has become one spiritually, and when they come together, you know, the other way, they create offsprings, which produces a likeness of their kind that even when Jesus, somebody would say, well, what did Jesus ever say? Y'all all against homosexuality? What did Jesus ever say? He confirms what the Bible says. Even, even when Jesus was asked about divorce, in the book of Matthew, Mark chapter number 10, the book of Mark chapter 10, Pharisees, which Paul was before. Verse, 20, verse 2 says, And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. They weren't trying to get an answer. They already knew what they wanted to do. That's how people do you if you're a Christian. People like to ask you questions to try to see what you're about. See how they can trip you up. 
We're in good company. This is the same thing they did to Jesus. Look, it says, tempting him, asked him, is it right for a man to put away his wife? And Jesus in his brilliance, I love Jesus. That, that's an understatement to say he's brilliant. But he's brilliant, though. This is, I can't think of anything better. He, he's brilliant in his brilliance. Let's listen to Jesus' answer. They asked him, is it okay to get divorced? Listen what Jesus answered. And he answered and said unto him, them, what did Moses command you? They, they knew he was going to go there. Jesus is brilliant. Listen, listen. What did Moses command you? And they say, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. In other words, Moses said it's okay to get a divorce. Now, that, that's a whole other story and lesson in and of itself. But in, but in short, God got taught to mess with Moses. Moses is God's man. And just as they try to do today, forcing me to call a woman a man and a man a woman, God get tired of it and he'll make, a, he'll make provision and then he'll come and judge divinely. And that's exactly what he did when they got, started messing with God's preachers. And so he gave him the right to break a building because he was releasing some of the pressure off of Moses. But that's never God's intention. And Jesus is getting ready to prove it. He's getting ready to prove it, but he's getting ready to prove it in a marvelous in a marvelous, brilliant way. Look what he says here. What did Moses command? And they say that Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put away his her, put her away. And Jesus answered, verse 5, Mark chapter 10, verse 5, and Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Listen, but from the beginning, he goes all the way back to Genesis. Jesus goes all the way back to Genesis. He didn't say, well, Solomon had a bunch of wives, or Abraham he had a bunch of wives, or even Isaac or Jacob, or, or look at David, he had wives as well. He, had, he didn't go to none of that. He went all the way back to what God still intends for today. He says, and listen, listen, for the hardness of the heart, he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning, verse 6, of the creation of God made them male and female. Jesus said there's a such thing as a male and a female. Now our Supreme Court news, Supreme Court justice don't know what, whether there's a such thing as a, a female or not. They can't get the de definition of a female. That, that's bizarre, church. But that, that's another whole thing. God made them male and female, Jesus said, for this cause. He's quoting what we just read. In Genesis chapter 2, Jesus is quoting what we just read because it never changed. God's never changed that, and it will not ever change. He's quoting it it's from the beginning of creation. God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The, and they twain, means two, shall be one flesh. Then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder, no, let no man separate. I want to say this to you. It's bizarre to me. Now, I know I wouldn't go for this. Evangelist Dallas and I, just, just a couple of weeks ago, October 11th, we celebrated 26 years of holy matrimony. 26 years. Now, if we were 26 years and she wouldn't marry me, you best believe I wouldn't have been there no 26 years. Because that's saying something to me. What's the deal? Well, some, well, some will say, well, it's just a paper. Or if it's just a paper, then go ahead and take the paper. See, see they, like, they try to get you on that argument. Well, it's just a piece of paper. Well, if it's just a piece of paper, then what's so hard about getting a piece of paper then? Because you know it's commitment. Don't give me that garbage It's just a piece of paper. That's nonsense. Because if it's just a piece of paper, just get the piece of paper. Make yourself legal. Get yourself on the books. And so you can get, be, be one flesh. If it's just a piece of paper, why take the end? Huh? It's just a piece of paper, and I don't, want, I don't need to get the piece of paper because it don't say nothing about my true love. 
Well, what you afraid of then? Well, every time somebody get married, they get divorced. Well, if you got true love, that would be a lie. It's been 26 years for us. So well, give, give me another one. What God has joined together, let no man separate. And if he's done it, then you'll do the necessary things to stand before Almighty God as a witness to make vows. To make vows. Not just this thing, you know, loose kind of thing, you know, we got our fingers crossed. Yeah, we love it together, but as soon as you hit me wrong, as soon as you rub me wrong, I'm out of the picture. It's easy like that. It ain't that easy, but, but they think it's that way. We've been created, church. We've been created in the image of God. And every aspect of that is very serious. I ain't mean for this message to be no hooping message. So if, you, if that's what you were thinking, I didn't mean for it to be. Hopefully it would be a lesson. Amen. There's a whole lot going on right now in our society that's coming against the almighty principles of God. And that's the reason why we have such chaos. Folks want to try to fix society, stop the violence, and want to protest and this and that, and don't want to go back to what the principles would kept it intact. When we did the will of God, the nation was intact. That's a fact. Look at the data. Don't listen to rhetoric. Look at the data of it all. When families were intact, when there was a, when there was a father in the home where a young man had to stand down to his father before he needed to stand down to the police officer. Amen. That's where the problem is. They don't have a father in the home now that they have somebody that they have to stand down to. Yeah. So they think they can go into society and everybody's going to back out of their way. Yeah. It don't work that way in life. Yeah. And a father teaches you, son, you stand down. You sit your tail down. That's what a father does. And so that when they get out there in the world, they know there's rules in life. Yeah. They know there's structure in life. Everything don't go your way. Everybody's not bucking up at you and looking at you like you're some king. You know that there's hard work intact that to get where you need to go. That's why we've been created in the image of God. 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 Image of God. I'm hoping I'm waking somebody up. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at God if you're mad, and then you better get glad soon because your way ain't going to work. I'll tell you that. It will not work. Try, we're trying it now. That's the problem. We're trying it now without God. And I, I've lived long enough. I'm 54. Next couple of weeks, I'll be 55 years old. I've lived long enough. I ain't old uh, um, as seen what some of the others have seen, but I've seen enough to know what changes have happened in my lifetime. And what has caused them? There was a time when we realized we were an image of God. And because you were an image of God and I'm an image of God, I respect your space. I respect who you are as a person. I ain't really to just to gun you down because you're in my way or to get your car. I like your car. Give it to me. Give me your money. We lost the, the fear and respect, not just for God, but who's in his image? Amen. You're just a person that's in my way. But when we realize we're all made in the image of God, there's respect. Yes. And the word of God teaches that. We're supposed to do esteem others better than ourselves. Why is that? Because we're in God's image. He says, don't just think about yourself, what you can get out of the deal. Think about what you can, how you can help somebody else because they created in God's image. They are made in my image, and I care for them. Well, when we lose that, we'll do anything to get what we want. And that's why we're in the place we are, church. And you can listen to all those, those others out there if you want to. Listen to the preacher today who's giving you the unadulterated word of God. And we listen to too many things out there 
before we listen to what the word of God says. And that's why we're in the, the state that we're in. And I'm going to let you go, but, but just as I said last week, every leader, every leader, whether you're the president of the United States, the president of China, or the president of your own home, every leader needs a preacher at his side Amen. to give wise counsel. Yes. Every, pre every leader. If you're the leader of your home, you need to be in church. Amen. And you need to be listened to what the Spirit of the Lord says by the preacher, Amen. by his word, strictly from the word of God. Amen. That's why I don't deviate off of what God has said. I point to you verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept. Amen. I ain't looking to see nobody shout. I want to see somebody transform, church. Amen. I want to see somebody transform. And we have to realize that God has made us after his own image. Yes. In the image of God, he made them male and female. Created he them yes. in God's image. And he's made us to be a chip off of his own block. Yes. Now, if he ain't a God going around shooting up everybody, what neither should we. If he's a God that's able to give his only begotten son because he cares about your life, we ought to better care about somebody else's life as well. Amen. Jesus Christ gave his life so that we may have life. That's the most selfless thing you can ever do. That's the most selfless thing. Not selfish. That's the problem. We're too selfish. That's the most selfless thing you can ever do is give your life to somebody else. And if we're chips off of the old block, we ought to live likewise. We ought to be likewise, church. Like I said, this message wasn't designed to get somebody hooping up. And I love a good shout. I do, church. I do. But to see people shouting and slobbering all over the place, and we leave out the same way we came in, making the same decisions that we've always made, world going in the hell in the handbasket, nothing's changed and we've had a good time in the Lord. Amen. Something's wrong with that picture. Amen. But the preacher has always been the counsel to leaders. Yes. He's always been the counsel to leaders. Search the scripture. He's always been the counsel to leaders. And a wise leader will listen. Amen. A wise leader will listen to what the Spirit has to say unto the church. Let's give God a glorious praise. Can we give him a praise today? We have been created in his image. Hallelujah. You have been fearfully and wonderfully made.